So um, today is our last day of Titus. Can you get my mom? Really? Well, I'm using that for heaven. No, see, so I kind of thought, you know, this week was the last week of, of, of school for kids, right? So, what was it, Friday? Most kids get out on Friday? No? Next Friday? Huh? All right. I don't even know what everybody's saying. But anyway, some kids are out already. Some kids are getting out, of, you know, next week. But I kind of feel like, you know, that maybe today we're kind of like those kids on that last day of school. You know, it's like finally over, right? You know, you feel like maybe for the whole school year we've been in the book of Titus, right? But we're about to be done with it today. Uh, the, the truth in this passage has, in this epistle, this letter, has just been so rich for us. And one thing I hope you see through us spending so much time in Titus, and others have preached a lot longer in Titus. This is our tenth week um, of a three-chapter book. Yeah. But one thing I want you to see is this, and I hope it's seen through this, is that Scripture is something that you can never exhaust the depth of the truth of. That every verse is rich and deep and worthy of attention. And we could literally spend months and months and months more in the, in the things that Titus has, has taught us. And so if there's anything other than the main themes in Titus that we've kind of gotten to that, that, that I hope maybe you see as we've spent so much time here is to not just read the scriptures in a cursory, skim kind of manner all, time, all the time. Dive in. Dig in. Each verse means something and is rich and deep. And, um, but we are going to finish it up uh, today. And for those of you who haven't been here through our study of Titus, let me just catch you up really quickly. There are some main themes in Titus that this last message actually is going to just kind of affirm. So you'll kind of get some of that today. But Paul has a, a fellow worker. His name is Titus. Paul, the great missionary who wrote a lot of the letters in the New Testament. He... He and, and Titus go to this island of Crete. Crete is off the coast of Greece. Crete is a very ungodly place, a very ungodly place. But there are Christians there. There, is a, there are churches there. And Paul and Titus go to Crete, and, 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 and Paul leaves Titus there to kind of get the church in order, get the churches in order. And so he tells Titus, he's like, look, set up elders in every town. Set up pastors, groups of pastors in each church. Set them up in, in every town. Why? Because in Crete, there were a lot of false teachings. A lot of false teachers. A lot of people that were using the gospel to teach false things. And, and Paul said, we have to guard the truth of the gospel. We've got to guard the truth of the message of the gospel. So one of the things that the elders were going to do is to teach sound doctrine and refute false doctrine. So he tells them to get elders set up, and he talks about false teachers a little bit in, in chapter 1. But, but another big theme in Titus was this. In this ungodly culture, Christians, live differently. Live differently. Live in a way that's different than your culture that shows the transforming power of the gospel to change lives and is a platform through which others will, will, will see your life and that you can speak the gospel that's changed your life to them so that they may have their life changed by the gospel as well. And so Paul talks about, in chapter 2, he talks about living a godly life. He speaks to older men, he speaks to younger men, he speaks to older women, he speaks to younger women, and just gives them some directives of how to live their life. And then another theme, we'll get to some of this as we wrap up today, is, is doing good deeds as a part of that godly life. Living lives that, that are doing good deeds and, and performing good works in the community, even in a society that's so ungodly that you may think aren't worthy of your grace and your generosity and your courtesy and your gentleness and your love and your doing good deeds to them. Do that to them. Show the gospel to them so that you can win their attention and affection that you might speak the gospel into their lives and they can be changed. And then... We'll get to this at the end of the message today. 
if you have not seen in these 46 verses of the book of Titus that this is a gospel rich letter the gospel of Jesus is it's almost like this book this this letter is a sponge and and the gospel is just saturating this book we'll kind of get to that at the end of the message today so there's some of the themes that that that, that the book of Titus has kind of kind of taught us and that this last message really is kind of going to address um, as we look at the last section of Titus. So turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, we'll start in verse uh, 9 and we'll go to the end of the book. Here we go. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. So I've taken this last um, uh, 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 passage and kind of just split it up into three sections. The first one is the protection of the gospel. The second one is the fellowship of believers. Oh, this is so beautiful. This, this will be so refreshing to us today, the fellowship of believers. And then we'll end with the section, the gospel and good works. The protection of the gospel, the fellowship of believers, and the gospel and good works. The protection of the gospel. So remember, there were false teachers in Crete. They were teaching false doctrine. One of the reasons that Paul set up elders in every town. We talked about that just a second ago. In chapter 1, we'll see that you know, there's qualifications for an elder, but their main goal, their main objective is to teach sound doctrine and refute false doctrine because the protection of the gospel is so crucial for the church to go forward. So, Paul tells Titus, that believers were to avoid pointless debates. He calls them, what does he say here? He calls them, uh, verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Foolish controversies. Okay? So, don't know exactly what all these things were, but we were to avoid these things that were, that were tangential. There's a big word. Um, discussions that really had nothing to do with the gospel. Maybe there were people who just liked to ponder theological things that, that, that really didn't apply to the gospel or our godliness or mission. It's like, well, what if God, you know, just stuff that, that really had no point. You know, a lot of times we like to, to just think and ask questions just to ask questions. Or maybe there were people who wanted to ask questions to attack the truth, and they really weren't looking for answers. They just wanted to ask questions and disrupt the congregation. You know what I'm saying? People that just talk about things that are foolish and they're, they're controversial things that, that really have no answer to. That there really no, is no answer for. Can God make a rock so big you can't lift it? I mean, whatever. You know? But, I mean, I make light of that. But there are people who, who, who just spend their time talking about things that really don't matter. That, don't, uh, that, that aren't focused on the gospel. That aren't focused on how it leads to our holiness and leading us to good works. Genealogies. He said, he said to avoid genealogies. And again, not sure exactly what's going on here. But through studying this week, maybe it's these folks who looked at the Old Testament genealogies and just made up these myths. And, and fanciful tales about who God was and what he did based on who he used and all that kind of stuff. It just made some extra biblical 
things that they just kind of tried to think about, and they became myth and legend and fable and all that kind of stuff, and just stuff that's, that's useless and pointless. We, we can do that, folks. We can get so interested in theological things that aren't foundational that we are so distracted by things that don't really matter. Dissensions. There were people in Crete that just were, were, were contentious and they liked to cause friction and they liked to cause dissensions and they liked to, to, to split the church apart instead of bring it together around the truth. Now let me say this. We do need to talk theology. We do need to talk doctrine. We do need to teach it. We do need to learn it. But as it relates to the gospel, the revealed truth of God, how it promotes our godliness, how it leads us to mission, anything that's just kind of these periphery things that really make no matter and all that, we need to avoid those things. Why? Because it distracts us. Distract us. We'll get to that in just a second. And then he says these, 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 these foolish arguments about the law. You know, these nitpicky things about the law. Maybe it was food laws or regulations and, and, and holy days and, you know, uh, all what, you know, things that, that the Jews imposed on the law that the law really wasn't teaching. Those extra laws that they just kind of came up with to make themselves feel good that if they obeyed them, maybe they were pleasing God. You know, I, I, all this stuff, and that even kind of touches on adding works of the law to salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And these Judaizers, these people who are adding to the law, are adding to uh, salvation works of the law that you have, you know, yeah, Jesus, grace, but you have to do this as well to be saved, and, and stealing away from the true gospel by grace. So crucial that we avoid these things that attack the truth of the gospel and get us distracted from things that are fundamental and crucial in our in our faith. And so I just I just want to want to go through this. These things are, are unprofitable because one, they distract us from godliness. So if you see Paul in chapter one, verse sixteen, he's talking about the false teachers. The people who are, who are uh, abusing the gospel and, and adding works to the gospel of grace. Or the people who are focused on genealogies. Or the people who are, who are focused on these foolish controversies, these dissensions. All these, all these people, they distract us from godliness. They distract us from good works. And they distract us from the motivation uh, and our mission. Here's how. In chapter 1... He's talking about these false teachers. And he says, they are unfit for any good work. And so here's, follow this. You've got false teaching, which makes them unfit for any good work. And then in chapter 3, he says, these, these controversies, this false teaching is unprofitable and worthless. So follow that. You've got, you've got false teaching that doesn't prepare you for good work. You're, you're unfit for any good work, Paul says. And because you're unfit for any good work, it, it is unprofitable and worthless for the church and for the community. But then, you come to chapter 3, and he's just... I get chills thinking about this, because this is awesome. He, 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 he's talking in, chapters, in, in chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, about the gospel. About how God has saved us by grace. And He's regenerating us and renewing us. And we've got a hope in heaven and all that kind of stuff. And He says, insist on these things. Insist on the gospel so that people who believe the gospel will be devoted to good works. So you've got sound doctrine, the gospel. Focus on the gospel. Being saved by the gospel. Regenerated or renewed by the gospel. So that, so that my people will be devoted to good works. Because that motivates good works. And then he says in verse 8, he says those things are profitable for everyone. They're excellent and profitable. So you see the point? False teaching leads to being unfit for any good work because if you got false teaching, you got false living, and that's unprofitable for anybody. But you got good teaching and you got good living, good work living, which is profitable for everyone. You see how what you believe affects the community around you? 
And so Paul says anything that takes away is a distraction from the truth as revealed in the word that centers around the gospel and our godliness and our mission. Just avoid that stuff. Because all it's going to do is distract you from godliness. You're not going to live your life pure. As a matter of fact, the false teachers were using their false teaching as an excuse to sin. They were, they were teaching falsely to make money. They would use it as a cover for sin. So they're not living godly lives. So they're not showing that they're different. They're living like the culture around them. That doesn't benefit anybody from the gospel. The people who follow the gospel do so it doesn't promote godliness. And then, when we get focused on things that really don't matter, and this, for Bible nerds like me, it's very tempting to sit around the table talking about theology and, and Bible stuff more than going out and living. And we can fix all our attention on study, 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 even things that really don't matter and it distracts us from living the life and serving and, and, and giving and, 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 and promote, you know, producing good works in our life that's beneficial to somebody to lead them to Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? But we need to study. But that study needs to lead us to godliness and good works that are excellent and, and, and profitable for the church and for the unbeliever. Does that make sense? So don't focus on those worthless things. Because they're unprofitable and they distract us from what we are to be about. I just want to read a few things here. Uh, John Calvin says, Paul does not acknowledge them, meaning the false teaching, the worthless things. Paul does not acknowledge them to possess any usefulness unless they tend to the increase of faith and to a holy life. And this is what Charles Spurgeon says. I love this. There are hundreds of questions which are thought by some people to be very important but which have no practical bearing whatever, either upon the glory of God or upon the holiness of man. And another place Spurgeon calls these questions upon points wherein Scripture is silent, upon mysteries which belong to God alone, upon prophecies of doubtful interpretation. So he continues, We are not to go into these matters. Let those who have time to waste take up these questions. As for us, we have not time enough for things that are unprofitable and vain. So what that means is when we get in all these ideas about questions that can't be answered and you know stuff that really doesn't matter to our life and godliness and mission, we are wasting time, right? We're wasting time on the things that have been revealed that lead to godly lives that a dying world needs to know. So don't be so selfish. Don't be so warped as to take and just focus on worthless things. Let's protect the gospel. Don't let it be misrepresented well. Let's focus on the gospel and not things that are just out there. Imaginations of, of ours. Questions that can't be answered. Debates about things that, pe that Christians, good, solid Christians, all through the ages haven't come to an agreement on. I mean, it's it's good to talk through Scripture and how it relates to the gospel and our godliness and mission and these issues, but if we're just hung up there and it's, and it's keeping us from living godly lives and, and, and on mission, then we're, we're, not, we're not being like we should. So we're, these are unprofitable because they distract us. They also spread false truths that destroy others. False teaching spreads false truth that leads to a false sense of salvation. You know people who think they're saved, but they're not. Because their belief in their salvation is based on a false doctrine that they've been taught. And when we don't protect the gospel, preach the gospel, and focus on the gospel, those folks hear a gospel that's not the true gospel, and their faith is something that's not a saving faith true gospel. So we must protect it because we want people to be saved. And then three, we these things are unprofitable because it leads the church into confusion and sin and it destroys our unity. These people in this Cretan church 
were, were creating factions in the church. In chapter 1, it says they are destroying families, upsetting families, it says. And it causes division in the church. And you got somebody in the church who wants to teach something false, who wants to teach something that's not in line with good Orthodox theology. And, 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 and you know, it starts to divide the church. And there's, you know, instead of being unified around the word and the things that, that are foundational to our faith, so it destroys unity and it leads people astray and, 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 and puts the church in confusion. So we must protect the gospel. And then Paul says, you know, if, if there's a divisive person among you, he says, what does he say in, in uh, verse 10? He says, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have, have nothing more to do with him. And so if you want to just a little picture of, of a divisive person, he's, Paul also talks to Timothy about this in 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5. But these divisive people, they, are law, they, they have a law unto themselves. Their, their sin, their, their, their divisiveness, their, their, their teaching falsely and focusing on worthless things, it's very public. It's habitual. It's serious. And it can lead to a lack of repentance. And this is serious in the church. So Paul says, look, you've got to confront it. But if he's rebellious, you've got to shun him. Galatians 5.20 says that factions creating divisions and, 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 and disunity in the church is a, is, a, is a work of the flesh. Right before Paul talks about, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, right in that chapter where we're talking about fruits of the Spirit, the, the, the works of the flesh, the fruits of the flesh, one of those is, is division, creating factions. Paul says in this verse, he's, he's sinning. He's warped. That word actually means he's living inside out. His life is not being lived on the basis of truth. He's living wrong way up, upside down. And eventually they expose themselves. They're self-condemned. And some may even say showing themselves, self-condemned means showing themselves to maybe not even be a believer at all. And so how do we deal with them? When I read that verse, you probably just heard the word shun. But I want you to notice what Paul said. He said, first, I want you to love them. And I want you to try to bring them back in. I want you to approach them once. I want you to approach them twice. We come in love. And he tells Timothy later to, to confront, the, the man of God must confront his opponents with gentleness. So we do it with gentleness. And we approach them in love. And we're trying to redeem them. We're trying to say, look, what you're doing is, is wrong. What you're teaching is wrong. What you're, what you're trying to do to the unity of our church is wrong. What you're doing to the gospel is wrong. Please, let's not do that. Let's come back in. And if he's like, I ain't doing it. Then you go again, you're love, you're like, man, you got to do, you know, and, and if you don't, then we avoid them. Why? Because love is important, but truth is also important. Love is important. That's what we're defined by, right? Jesus said they will know you by your love for one another. But the truth is also important. Love, this sappy love that just doesn't want to confront sin and error, destroys the church. Because if all we are is a bunch of sappy people who love each other, no matter what we believe in truth isn't important, then what are we really meeting to gather, to worship, to share, to stand on to begin with? Truth is important. We lead with love. But if they're rebellious, showing themselves to be sinful, stubborn, maybe even not a believer at all, we shun them. We avoid them. Now, some will tell you that this is one of those passages that talk about church discipline. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 18, go to the one who sinned against you, and if he doesn't respond, take somebody with you, and if he still doesn't respond, take him before the church, and if he still don't respond, then excommunicate him, cast him out of the church. They're proving themselves likely to not even be a believer at all. Some would say that this is a church discipline passage. I'm not sure about that. Maybe so. A lot of folks I really respect think this is a church discipline passage. There are others that, that I read this week that think that this is not necessarily kicking them out of the church, but it's just a stay away from them. Don't listen to them. 
Don't let them infiltrate your, your mind and affect you and, and what you believe and, and good, solid understanding in, in, in your heart and your mind that is going to distract you from what you need to be about. Danny Aiken says, overlooking sin is not gracious, but is dangerous. If we don't confront falsehood, that's a dangerous thing for our church, for the church. So we must confront it in love, in a redemptive way. But then, if there is no response, then we shine. And I was thinking about this, and I was like, and then reading through some things, and this this thing right here that we're talking about now, our church is incredibly weak in, by the way. And many churches are incredibly weak in this area. Because I think we lean way too much and just wanting to to to, to not have broken relationships with one another, so we're scared of confrontation. A lot of churches are driven too much by the pocketbook or whatever, and they don't want to disrupt anything that's going to cause problems for the church. But we've got to confront this. And what's happened is this, is the tolerance of our culture has crept into the church, and for some reason we think when we're tolerant of false teaching, we're loving somebody when we're actually doing the exact opposite. When we're letting somebody continue in their false ideas or lead other people in false ideas and destroying the unity of the church. That's not loving. So somehow the tolerance of our culture has crept into us and whenever we confront with some, somebody we don't like to do that so we don't do it because we're just being tolerant. We do it in love. We do it with gentleness but we stand on the truth. So Paul's talking about protecting the gospel here. It's like a like a like the like a filter in your vacuum cleaner or you know one of these air vents or whatever you put a filter in. You don't want dust to get into the, the motor or the you know the, the unit. It's not very tolerant for the dust. You're keeping them out. But it's best for the motor to keep running effectively. It's the same thing with false teaching. We gotta filter it out so we can run effectively and, and not be adulterated by anything. Our unity is so important. This is good for the person because it can lead them to repentance. It's good for other Christians, for the health of the church as a whole, for the corporate witness of the church, and for the glory of God as we reflect Him through a lifestyle of good deeds and godliness promoted by good teaching. And then he jumps into the fellowship of believers. And I'll just spend a few minutes here, but I want you to see some things. He, he, he introduces four different people specifically. There's Artemis, there's Tychicus, there is um, uh, Zenos, the lawyer, and there is, uh, what's the other one, Apollos, right? So Artemis, we don't know really anything about except for here, right? Tychicus, we know, he's, he's a pretty cool dude. He's a, man, he's a stud. He's a faithful follower of Jesus. Colossians 1, 27, oh, that that could be said of us. Just a faithful follower. He's the one who's, who carried Paul's letter to the Colossians and the Ephesians. Just a faithful follower. Then there's Zenos the lawyer. Again, we don't know anything about him. We don't know even what kind of lawyer he was. He could have been a lawyer who studied Jewish law and was very... Uh, Astute in that. He, might, he could have been a Roman litigator. We just don't know. There are arguments for either. And then there's Apollos. We know Apollos from Corinthians, that, that great uh, proclaimer of the truth. And, and, you know, remember when Paul said some follow Paul, some follow Apollos, you know, and all that vision that happened there. I mean, this guy could teach. We're introduced to these four different guys. And one of the things we want to see is this, is that just the mention of these names and two names that we know nothing about other than just their mention here shows that the church of Jesus is growing, right? The fellowship of the church is growing. There are people that we only hear mention of once in Scripture that are good enough, uh, adept enough, and, and leading that Paul would send them to Crete, maybe, to, to lead the church. That there's a lawyer that's 
obviously been saved. And there's Apollos that are on a missionary journey. And so here are people that we don't even know about. Our, our normal cast of characters, Paul, Peter, you know, all those guys. There are other people out there. So it may, makes you wonder, how many other folks, how many other leaders, how, how much else was God doing among people growing His church? We see that God's growing His church, and He's been growing His church, and He'll continue to grow His church until He takes His church to be with Him forever. Fellowship of believers is strong and real. It also shows that, that, that Titus was a part of a team. Here you got these guys, you know, Artemis and Tychicus, you know, wherever they were, Paul sending them, you know, uh, at least one of them there. So they're kind of all in this thing together. There's Zenos and there's Apollos, and, and they're coming, and, 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 and the Cretan church is supposed to, to help them make sure they're lacking nothing. Titus is supposed to make sure they're lacking nothing and just provide for these missionaries, support these missionaries, encourage these missionaries as they go to their next task or whatever they're doing, support them, encourage them. The fellowship of believers here. We're seeing the connection of what the fellowship of believers does for one another. And then if you jump down to verse 14, Paul says, make sure that our people devote themselves to good works. Our people. Now, in this specific context, he's talking about the believers in Crete. But we know that all believers around the world, we're all one big family. All the believers around the world, those are our people. And this reminded me of that country song. Um, I'm, I'm a, I am ai do not know if I'll try to say, uh, these are my people. Have you heard that song? I where I come from. You know that song, right? So you know that song. Yeah, I knew I'd get some over here. I was hoping you'd be here, actually, because I knew you'd know it, right? These are my people. These are where I come from, right? And, and, and then the, what's his name? Is it Rodney Atkins? Is that him? Yeah. All right, so these are my people. These are where I come from. And, and you listen to the song. I looked at the lyrics, and I was like, oh, the tragedy of that song for the believer. Because what is the thing in that song that, 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 this, that this Rodney, that, or whoever's singing the song, or whoever he's trying to represent, identifies as his people? It's the people he grew up with. It's the people that he partied with. It's the people that after the work day he went to the bar with. It's the people that he, that, that he chased girls with. It's the people that he played sports with. It's the people that, that, that came from his same hometown. It's the people that were educated like he was. It was all these earthly connections when he, that, that he said, these are my people. Now, before you think I'm just trying to... I understand what you say. I understand we have connections and earthly connections with people that, that, that we can identify with and we have in common with. But... For the believer, nobody that we share any earthly connection with is more our people than the people with whom we share a spiritual connection with in Christ. Look, no matter where you over here or you over here, you, you come from, schooled, not schooled, played sports, didn't play sports, had a party lifestyle or grew up a, a goody two-shoe or whatever, if you are in Christ, these are your people. Not the people that you have an earthly identity with. And herein lies the problem, I think, with the church and our community with one another. Is we connect more with people out here and earthly things that are going to fade fast than the people we're going to be spending forever with because of the blood of Jesus. And we have to stop valuing the things of this earth and start valuing the things of our salvation and with whom we share that in common with. Church, these are your people. I know you have things in common with people you went to school with and grew up with and people who listen to country music. Just kidding. I knew the song. You know, I know you have earthly things in common with people and I'm not just trashing that, but I'm just saying stop Stop thinking of your people as these earthly things you share earthly connections with. 
person who is your different race and your different gender and your different background and your different everything, if you have Christ in common, you have more in common with that person than any person you share any earthly identity with. So we got to start looking at each other that way. The fellowship of believers. And then there's the greetings. i gotta, I got to go fast. Notice what he does in, in the greetings. He, he, he greets them. He sends greetings to them. He said, all who are with me send greetings to you. Send love to those who, who love us. Or send greetings to those who love us. And what he's doing to these Cretan believers is he's saying, look, you're not alone. There are people across the miles, across the waters, that are thinking about you. And you may be living in an ungodly culture. Maybe they were too. And you may be thinking you're alone, you're a small in number, whatever the situation was. But from across the miles, we love you. And we support you. And we send greetings to you. You're not by yourself. You're a part of a bigger family. And you're not forgotten. And oh, what a grace this must have been for Titus who is there trying to lead a church in a very ungodly culture to know that Paul was thinking about him and thought about him enough to send him a letter and that, that, that believers with Paul sent him greetings. And it just... Guys, we, I'm talking to myself here. we got to do a better job of communicating with our missionaries, letting them know that they're not forgotten. We're praying for them. Our believers in Africa, or, or if you know believers in a place maybe where they're a smaller minority, we've got to communicate with them more. We've got to send them our greetings. What, what believers that you know of need to hear your greetings so they know they're not alone and they know they're not forgotten and love can be shared across the miles? If Paul could share love across the miles in that day and age when they didn't have smartphones and the Internet, surely we can do it today. Paul always had other believers around him. He said, me and all those who are with me. You look through the New Testament, Paul was constantly wanting people around him. Why? Because we need each other. You need your people. People who say, I can be a Christian and don't go to church are dead wrong. You can't live the Christian life and not go to church because you need the church. Don't give up meeting together as some in the habit are doing but meet together and encourage one another and stir one another up to love and good deeds. We've got to get in each other's faces so we don't become hardened by sin, Hebrews says. We need each other. We need the church, the family, our people around us. And then he says, grace be with you all. We're desiring grace for one another. It's grace that saved you. It's grace that sustains you to live this life of godliness and mission in an ungodly culture. And so lastly, last section, I, know, I see the time. We've, we've looked at the protection of the gospel. We've looked at the fellowship of believers. And now just briefly, I want to, to look at the gospel and good works. I think this is a very fitting place to end our book of Titus. Because the gospel should be central in everything we do. And bear with me as we end this thing up and really tune in. Because there, there are 46 verses in the book of Titus. Nine of them, that's almost one-fifth, okay, math experts. Almost one-fifth of the book of Titus is, Titus is completely devoted to two extensive explanations of the gospel. And that's... Basically, what, what those nine verses are talking about. Just a remembrance of the gospel. Paul, in his letter to Titus, spends one-fifth of the time just explaining, remembering the gospel. And, and those two times are very close together. At the end of chapter 2 and right there near the beginning of chapter 3. And remember, this letter was intended to be read as one Time. So all of a sudden, Paul just goes through the gospel. Then he says a few things in, in just a couple verses. And then he jumps back into the gospel again. 
That's not to mention all the times in this letter that he talks about sound doctrine and the doctrine of God and all that that's, that's talking about the gospel. There are allusions to the gospel, explanations of the gospel, all in this book, these 46 verses. But what does that tell us? It tells us that we need to remember the gospel. You don't outgrow the gospel. You need to constantly be reminded of the gospel. Why? Because when we're reminded of the good gospel, the good doctrine of the gospel, it leads us and motivates us to good works and sharing the grace with, with church and the grace with the community that we've been given in Jesus so that maybe we can lead them to Christ and show them a life transformed by the power of the gospel. We've got to keep devoting ourselves to remembering the gospel. So I'm going to challenge you. What do you need to do every day to make sure you are face to face with the gospel of Jesus that has saved you? And you don't forget what he's done for you every single day. Earlier in our, our study of Titus, I challenged you to, to memorize Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. That's one of those gospel explanations. The other one is Titus 3, 3 through 7. Memorize one of those. Let it fill your mind. Make sure in your prayer every day you're reminding, I was a sinner. Jesus saved me. So if this letter is dripping with the gospel now, let's just get a little water on us right now, right? You were lost in your sin, completely hopeless and helpless. Rebellious toward God your Savior. You, you were like my son yesterday, right? He's almost two. And his sin nature is in full effect. I know some of you are going to get me. He still has a passy. Or a pappy as I call it. Passy down there. Mommy passy. Daddy pappy. And we're trying to teach him. I mean, he, he used to do a really good job saying thank you, but he stopped kind of saying thank you. So we're trying to, trying to continue to teach him to say thank you. So he wanted his passy. I handed it to him. I said, tell daddy thank you. And he wouldn't do it. Tell daddy thank you. I wanted to give him the passy, but he would not say thank you. So I'd give it to him, say thank you. He'd just look at me or turn and go do something else. So I'd take the passy from him, hold it a little bit. He wanted to get, you know, tell him that he never said thank you. He finally got to the point where he got the passy. I said, tell daddy thank you. And he took his passy and just threw it on the ground because he knew I was going to take it from him. <laughs> and he fell asleep not telling me thank you because he was rebellious and he wanted to do what he wanted to do and not what his daddy wanted him to do. And that's who we are. We are rebellious. We are sinners. We don't submit to the authority of God and we want to do our own thing and we want to be our own gods and there's pride and there's idolatry and there's selfishness in us and God created us for his glory but we live like that and we're so worthy of condemnation. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he paid for your sins through an act of mercy and grace. And, and as Paul says in Titus, the grace of God appeared and he took on flesh and, 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 and he became our sin and he was crushed for our sin. He paid the penalty for our sin. He rose from the dead for our justification to make us right with God. That if by faith we trust Him, our sin can be forgiven. We can enter into a relationship with Him that begins now and continues through eternity. It's grace. That's the gospel. You couldn't do anything to earn it. You just had to receive it. There's no adding works to this. You just receive it by faith. Now, then that faith produces works. Right? It's not real faith if works aren't produced. You're not saved by works. You're saved for works. You understand the difference? He, in Titus 2.14, after he goes through one of these gospel things, he said, you know, Jesus saved us to purify himself for a, a people who are zealous for good works. In, in, in chapter 3, to, so that we can be devoted to good works. Ephesians 2.10 says we were created, made alive in Christ, who, who created us for good works. Jesus saved you through faith, but because that faith given by him is real, he's going to produce good works in your life if you're saved. Good works aren't the means of salvation. They're the result of salvation. And so he says not to be unfruitful. Give yourself to good works motivated by the gospel. 
grace given to you, you share with others. Share with the church. Share with Zenos and Apollos who need, need some help in their next missionary journey. Do good deeds with them. Provide for urgent needs in the church. Provide for urgent needs in the community. Don't be unfruitful. That reminds me of John chapter 15. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And in that, especially in verse 8, he talks about us being saved to, to bear fruit. So this gospel that has saved us is intended to motivate us to good works in a community that desperately needs to see the grace and mercy of Jesus. So don't be unfruitful. Don't be unfruitful. If you're professing to be a believer and you're not showing fruit, it could be that you never were saved to begin with. That's serious. It could be that the very thing that you if you are a believer that you were saved for and you're struggling with an unfruitful period in your life, that you're like a Jedi without a lightsaber, man. You don't, you don't know, you, you, you're not even, you know, what do I do? What am I doing? What good am I? That what God saved you for, you just, you know, Maybe the biggest tra tragedy of an unfruitful Christian, not living a godly life, good deeds in the church and the community, showing the grace motivated by the gospel, is this, and I'll end with this, that a world consumed in darkness, the darkness just proportionally speaking, numerically speaking, far and away, is greater than the number of people in the world that have the light of Jesus. And the darkness of this world needs every single member changed by the gospel to be shining the light of the gospel, to expose the darkness, consume the darkness, and defeat the darkness. So the people in the world, blind to the gospel, living in darkness, that we can be used by God as he opens their eyes and lets them see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That maybe he did that through good works and godliness that you lived your life and you had the chance to speak the gospel to them or you were just a player that God used and maybe somebody else spoke the gospel in their life. We've got to shine the light of Jesus to a world consumed in darkness. There's no better way to end Titus than that. Because that's the point of the book. Live differently in a godly society so they'll know the grace and mercy of Jesus. So let's do it, amen? Let's pray. God, you are so, so, so good. Thank you for this letter. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus. Thank you for the grace that has saved us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are so in tune with your church that you allow us to see and understand the truth and that you want to work that out in our lives and you want to make us who you want us to be. Help us to yield and be obedient and live lives that glorify you. God, There very well could be people in this room that have never been saved by the gospel of Jesus. And if there are those, would you bring them to salvation? Would you let them know the grace that is theirs, the mercy that is for them in their lost condition? That you are the hope for their souls and their forgiveness and their future. God, do your sovereign work of salvation.
God, for those of us in this room who are believers, may the lessons of Titus, motivated by the grace of the gospel, carry us into a, a godless, ungodly world to show and share grace. Holy Spirit, have your way. And to you, the congregation, I would say, if you, if you want to respond to Jesus today in a, in a physical way, you want to talk to somebody, Terry Wells, our church advisory team, chairman will be up here at the front. I'll be here at the front. We'll pray with you. We'll talk with you. The altar will be open if you want to come pray at the altar. I know many times people respond at their seat, and I encourage you to do that. Most importantly, I pray that we all leave responding. So as we stand and sing, um, give in to the Holy Spirit what he's leading you to do at this moment. Let's stand and sing together. Titus. Good, good time going through the book of Titus. If you enjoy kind of going through chronologically a book of the Bible, I invite you to go on Wednesday evenings. We're going through the book of Romans uh, at 630. I'd love for you to come and be part of that. Uh, there's no activities here tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all next Sunday. I hope you have a wonderful time. Thanks for being here. God bless you.